Good morning, everybody. Um, we have uh, everybody in the right seat. Uh, we have the right time going on. It's, it's going great. We've just finished our first uh, topic about uh, cities. We're now going more widely into, into, into the economy, uh, national economy, of course. Um, I'll start with a quick round of uh, introductions. Uh, we've got uh, Seem Tucker right next to me, who is the CEO of RA Technologies, which is using data-driven AI solutions to reduce uh, building operational expenses, increase property value, reduce CO2 emissions, and achieve sustainability compliance. And they're managing over 2.5 million square meters doing that. Uh, Tarvang uh, is the CEO of Fusebox, which is using software to manage energy storage systems and help you balance your energy portfolio, uh, boost trading, and more to help save almost 1,000 tons of CO2 per year. Uh, Robin Zaluox uh, over, over there is the CEO of Agronom, uh, which is helping farmers monitor and verify sustainable practices generate carbon credits uh, and increase agricultural efficiency while gaining better access to future financing as well, which is a critical topic uh, for farmers. And uh, Kati Riskok on your very left, my very right, is the CEO of Cleantech Estonia, the Estonian Cleantech Sector Association, uh, which is working to build a supportive environment for implementing tangible green change and is already expanding beyond Estonian borders as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for joining me on stage. Um, I want to start with a more general question and would like to hear, I mean, we're, we're all sort of in the, in the private sector uh, here. I would like to hear your opinions, though. Um, so, I mean, all governments, businesses and citizens have become increasingly aware of, of uh, their environmental impact. I think overall that's a positive development. We can probably agree. Um, some of this is greenwashing. You know, some of the companies are just, you know, putting a green label on the same thing they've been doing before. But there has also been very tangible change uh, for uh, the, the better. Um, in your view, from your perspectives, how can we most quickly, most cheaply, most easily uh, mitigate the impact that we as humans have on the environment. Let's start from your right to your left. Seem. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here. So, um, so I, I look at from that side that uh, that real estate actually accounts for 40 percent of uh, carbon CO2 uh, or CO2 emissions globally. So there's. Uh, a lot that needs to be made in that sector in order to achieve the Paris climate deal and goals and also drive towards uh, uh, carbon neutrality. Um, and we are like, we've been developing an AI based solution uh, that actually reduces on average more than 20% of the carbon footprint uh, in uh, buildings. So it has significant impact if it's taken to use. So basically, if all buildings would be using, then hey, we have already achieved our Paris climate goals. So there's a little bit like technology adaption that we see that people are a little bit reluctant to take the technology to use. Uh, they, there might be, hey, what is this? Does it actually work? But it is an already proven solution. So it's more like, a, let's, let's take actually the technology use and, and uh, let's achieve these uh, climate goals. I'm, I'm going to jump in on that immediately, and I, I would like to combine these two questions for everyone else on stage as well. Uh, you, you mentioned it so nicely, very nice segue for me. Um, people's reactions, the culture towards these green uh, uh, developments, um, you are mostly working in, let's say, traditional industries. What is the reaction uh, to, to the kind of things that you're, that you're providing? Yeah, there's definitely like this ad adaption. Um, there's, does it really work? Can't believe, right? So, uh, uh, but uh, in general, this real estate industry, when I talk about it, then it has come through like this digitalization process quite recently. So systems and buildings are e e becoming and are already really, really digitalized. So there's a lot of information. And if AI systems take this, so uh, this information to use, then systems can be controlled more efficiently than they are today, and by just using uh, very, very good technology. Um, and uh, there are like different cultures, different countries. As we work through like 17 countries, I think already 18 countries together with Japan, then. Uh, 
um, yeah, we, we can see that uh, there's a different hesitation or if it's a new technology in the market then people don't really know so we have to increase the awareness and so on and so the, the first cases need to go through but I would say that it's actually quite proven solution actually to achieve our uh, climate goals already today. Very well. Uh, Tarvo, what, uh, how do you approach the topic of the transition to a green economy and, uh, and what has been the reaction in your area? When we're talking about electricity, for example, then we're already moving to the right direction, installing renewables and, and so on. But there are very many problems uh, involved in this uh, transition to the renewables. For example, uh, the sun or the wind is just not always there when we, when we need them. So we, there are constraints or problems in the electricity system so that uh, um, you cannot install so much renewables as, as you would love to or, or you actually can because uh, the electricity system will collapse during the evening or when, or when there is no, no sun. So still you have to uh, construct or build the electricity system according to the highest peak in the electricity consumption you might have. But uh, from our point of view, it's, the solution is actually really easy. You don't have to build gas power plants or, or oil or whatever based fast reacting uh, reserves or, or build uh, huge, very expensive battery packs everywhere. Uh, actually, we have the solution that uh, everybody consumes electricity at home. Is it fridge? Is it a, um, a heat pump or, or whatever when we're talking about uh, buildings or, or industrial sites, there is everywhere some kind of flexibility in your electricity consumption. And uh, we develop technology to tackle it. So our technology, with our technology, energy companies throughout the world, wherever they are, uh, can go after those assets and use them as a substitute for fossil fuel generators. So it's easy. We just need to look around us and, uh, for example, if you're buying a heat pump, then you must ask, is it smart grid ready? Is it, is it flexible? Can, can we use it not only for heating my water or, or house, but also can this uh, device participate in the electricity system, uh, bringing me in money and savings as well? Mm. So we have to... Uh, keep in mind that there must be a, a business or, or benefits for the consumers as well to participate and take this risk. So you would say that, uh, that your target uh, group has also been very open towards that change because it does not uh, create too much, you know, sort of uh, uh, interruption to their daily activities or... None whatsoever. Yeah. The, the person or the company who has this flexibility in their electricity consumption uh, cannot feel or understand in any ways that they are participating. Their life must go on. People are lazy and uh, too comfortable to bear any kind of uh, discomfort, I would say. Uh, Robin, overall, I mean, the, the question for you is the same. I would add a, a small bonus question towards the cultural direction. Um, how do you explain carbon credits to farmers and what is their reaction to the whole shebang? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I would start from this, that in general, I think European Union ETS system is working quite well. Can you tell everybody in the audience what that is exactly? So EU ETS system, it's an um, emission trading system uh, that big polluters have to pay quotas if they're emitting, and there is a limited, limited amount of quotas, emission licenses basically, and you reduce them every year until you reach to zero. So, uh, and then market can play it out in which like for one company, it's more efficient to reduce emissions. For another company, it's more, uh, today still more efficient to buy those quotas. Uh, but this obviously has to expand to more sectors today. It's only the big emitters. It's going to transportation sector in 2027 or 8, and eventually, hopefully, to all other sectors as well. Uh, now, more specifically about farming, um, profitable business model uh, should be around promoting those sustainable practices. Farming will be uh, carbon neutral. There is no question about that. The practices make sense for farmers anyways, but there has to be a profitable business model around promoting these practices. Uh, well, it has to be as profitable as selling more fertilizers or chemicals and so on. But, um, and for this, we need three main things. 
well, one is new know-how to farmers, so they need new knowledge. Uh, second is uh, some financial incentives. This is something that they are already there. So we, we are working with uh, uh, well, food companies who are incentivizing farmers in their value chain to uh, lower their emissions. We are working with some banks and airlines who want to offset their emissions and are ready to pay farmers to store carbon in the soil. And we are also working with some banks who want to give uh, sustainable loans to farmers, like they give better terms if you buy an electric car. So incentives are there. So first of all, new know-how. Secondly, uh, incentives. And thirdly, a uh, scalable way to quantify carbon emissions. And this is where also technology comes into the uh, game. And uh, so this is what we do as well. We help to measure uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the farm verify what practices farmers are doing with satellites and uh, tractor integrations and etc. Now, coming back to your question about how, how do we bring this message to farmers, it's quite easy actually. Uh, we are not talking about carbon credits that much, we are talking about improving their soils. And improving soils in farm is a profitable thing anyways. So I'm coming from the farming family, uh, way before the carbon kind of industry, way before e acronym got into carbon business, we had positive humus balance and carbon neutral farm because we thought in the long run it's good for our farm anyways. Uh, just there is not that much, uh, historically there hasn't been that much promotion around these practices, cover cropping, reducing cultivations, crop rotations and so on. Now with this new industry uh, where sustainable practices are also incentivized, there are private companies emerging, e Agronom and many of our competitors, emerging to promote these sustainable practices. But, but we don't talk about carbon that much, we talk about improving the soils. I think also this uh, demysticization of, of technologies, you know, wh whether, whether it's what, what you do or, or anything else, is really important that we don't just throw around the blockchains and the AIs and everything, but just talk about real solutions for real people. I think that's very valuable. Um, Caddy, you of course, uh, as uh, working, working with, uh, with Cleantech Estonia, you've got a wider view of what is going on in the sector, uh, both in Estonia and probably also with, with the other European counterparts that you deal with. Um, how would you describe the current state of the sector um, and, and what's, what's the future? What does the future hold uh, for your area? Cleantech Estonia has been working with the, uh, with the sector in Estonia since its early days in 2016. Uh, it was really an emerging sector with a few actors and, and we didn't have any scale-ups, any big success stories in the cleantech field back then. Um, so, so back then our focus was really on how do we bring innovation out of universities, out of garages to the market and supporting on that. And, and I'm really glad to say that today, uh, the questions that the uh, companies ask us and, 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 and where we can be of help is actually growth stage questions. How do we go to foreign markets? Um, how do we attract foreign investors? How do we grow bigger and faster? And, and in that, um, to, to come to the main topic of, uh, of today, the digital, um, it's, it's, also, it's also very central, actually. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that digital is really empowering that sector. Um, um, but maybe to come back to what my uh, uh, previous speakers uh, said, um, I, think, um, I think what's very important in the green transition is the collaboration it's the synergy that we can create between the innovators who bring the solutions um, and the bigger actors, the historical sectors that need to start using those innovations. And once we get that symbiosis going, the investors are definitely coming behind that because that creates the security of, of sustainable growth for this sector. And I would say that to bring together um, bigger actors um, with the new innovators, it's very important. And in the EU, we're especially uh, strong in that. Um, um, I think it's partly due to our very strong environmental legislation, but it's also developing elsewhere. And it's good to see that there's more and more collaboration that is also pan-continental uh, in the clean tech sphere, and I would say that Estonian companies are very good at that, and in European companies in general. 
Um, so I would say, yes, we're in a growth stage, acceleration stage in cleantech, and, and uh, I think we're very well positioned to take those opportunities in this new market. Um, you mentioned the uh, the Estonian, but also the European level, and, and that, that was actually where my next question was going to, to go as well. Um, I mean, clean technologies often are quite uh, R&D heavy. You know, there's a lot of work that goes into uh, developing the product before you can really bring it to market. Uh, you can't just sort of, uh, re you know, iteration after iteration and, and do stuff until it works. Um, so how, how have you seen, uh, from the organizational perspective, uh, the financial support uh, investments, whether it is from, from private investors, whether it is uh, from governments or the EU. How has the openness uh, been recently? How has it developed over the years? Would you say that it's been quite encouraging? Or I think it's developing well. Um, our specific uh, in Estonia and I think the Baltics is that we're very, we have been historically very digital focused. The SaaS business models, they're completely different stuff for investors. Uh, the investment horizons are shorter um, and, and, and yeah, way less riskier as well. And, and so I think we're arriving at a stage where uh, the same investors who were investing in SaaS before are now switching more and more towards uh, clean tech. So it's a very good evolution. I think that um, public subsidies and, and collaboration with the state has been a big part of this um, interest from the investor side. Um, it does de-risk to know that the legislation is not going to change overnight and go against those business models. So I, th I think the state has to take the first step, and, and they have done so in Estonia and in all over Europe, and I would say also all over the world, it's starting to go in that direction. Um, but we do have some other continents, some other countries that are historically industrial, and of course their local investors are, are way more used to hardware, so, so perhaps there we have something to learn from them. But again, to mix clean tech with the data and digital solutions, I think here Estonia has something to teach also. Um, I would ask the same question to, to Robin Tarvo and also Seem. Um, how has your personal experience in your companies been with uh, openness from, from investors, governments, and so on? How has that interaction been? Yeah, well, for us, it was actually, well, one of the reasons why we went into uh, carbon farming was uh, to attract investors. So we started as a farm management software that I built initially for my father, and then it spread around to thousands of farmers. Uh, but, but we always thought there is more behind this data. Uh, and then there was a question, how, how can we leverage this data? Will we build marketplace to sell more inputs to farmers? Will we kind of build new tools to upsell to farmers and so on? Uh, but, uh, but then uh, this kind of carbon market emerged and we understood that now there are enough incentives to really promote sustainable practices. And uh, we also understood that this is an attractive thing for investors. Now, if we speak with uh, VCs uh, right now, then around 50% don't understand at all about the carbon market, and to them we sent some information to read about it and so on. Uh, but uh, but the other half, they are really interested in understanding this. I think now we're already in this stage that they also understand some of the challenges that come on board with this and so on, but, uh, but still it's, uh, well, I think even though uh, in general, the VC investments have been declining. In the climate sector, it has been increasing. So that shows as well that uh, the trend is, uh, well, beneficial actually to, to startups. I would say it's a statement of intent towards the, the green economy development. So that's, that's good to hear. Tarvo. I would say that uh, there are huge problems in energy. There are very many people looking for solutions, but there are only few companies who can provide solutions. And we are doing clean tech software as a service. So what can be better for investors? <laughs> yeah. So it's an easy, easy fit, you would say? Yeah, we, we had to do an investment round last year. And we Full really after had... One day. Uh, uh, sorry? <laughs> Full after one day? Uh, pretty, pretty much we <laughs> had the, uh, the possibility to really handpick the investors that we wanted to have in our cap table leaving out those who had money only, let's say, and uh, going on with those guys with whom we can grow and who can contribute and give our team new thoughts, new 
understanding and, and so on. Awesome. That's, that's really good to hear, actually. Sim. Yeah, I would also echo that this clean tech sector is definitely like a sector that the investors are looking into uh, uh, right now, even though it's like low season in general uh, related to venture capital. Um, but there is a general transition already happening towards a green economy and energy and, uh, and clean solutions that help to reduce the carbon uh, emissions is definitely like a, one of the core focuses for uh, venture capital firms. Uh, so we've been raising also capital along the many years, so the company is already operating more than six years, uh, and it has been from that side like up, ups and downs, like uh, our real estate sector was very heavily impacted by the COVID season. Mm -hmm. A lot of buildings were shut down uh, and basically stopped op operations for a short while and then followed by this getting back to work and now there is uh, this uh, high pressure from the vacancies, uh, high pressure from the inflation rate. So this uh, real estate sector is under really uh, strong pressure right now. And they need to achieve also their uh, sus sustainability goals and ESG goals. And so there's a lot of things that are happening and impacting the overall real estate industry. Uh, so therefore, this kind of uh, AI based uh, uh, SaaS models work really well that provide really fast uh, return on the investment of uh, approximately three months or just, you know, taking the technology to use that help you to manage your buildings more efficiently. And from that side, it's actually generating a lot of uh, attractiveness uh, for the investors. Uh, how I see as well is that maybe six years ago, not so many investors knew about Estonia, <laughs> about this uh, digitalized country, what are the options, but uh, over the years, the awareness has increased. Uh, and I think this Eastern Europe was in general uh, impacted by the war in the Ukraine, where a lot of investors to, had extra hesit hesitation, hey, how, how would this war is going to impact actually these countries as well? Um, so we at least had these kind of questions <laughs> and we have moved around a lot of our servers and, <laughs> and so on. So they would be have, providing additional confidence that actually this is, this uh, company is going to survive and it's, uh, and it's Estonia is not going to be uh, next uh, Ukraine, right? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things that uh, NATO is providing, EU and so on. So there's actually confidence that Estonia is a very, very uh, attractive place where to invest and making sure that the investment is growing. So, and the Estonians, uh, I think it's kind of like unique nations from that side that actually people are here very in international minded. We always think, uh, outside of Estonia, we look what are the global problems, what are the European problems, and then we try to address them. So in the countries where we operate, there are a lot of like uh, thinking more like what are, what are the local solutions, what are our, our specific countries' problems. Let's, let's start from solving old country problems and then we move on to the other countries. So Estonians controversially are operating in a digitalized society and we always look uh, like a global market. So uh, there are differences from that side. But for sure, like uh, growing the company to certain states and then maybe there's some HQ transition to a larger capital where there's uh, more human capacity closer to the business relations and so on. So I guess we all will be facing it in different growth stage. <laughs> uh, how do we access to the wider markets and so on? But it's, uh, it's funny, you mentioned one of the, I guess every country has its own luxuries in that way. You know, if, uh, if, I, if I think about a country like Germany or, or India that just has such a huge industrial base that they can say, you know what, screw it, let's build cars. You know, yeah. we have 100,000 people that we can just throw at this problem until it works in one way or, or another. Um, in Estonia, uh, of course, you know, people know each other more closely because it's a, it's a bit of a village uh, with 1.3 million people. Um, and, uh, and I guess the luxury is that whatever solution you're thinking about, Estonia cannot be your only market. It just can't be, you know. Uh, so you're, you're forced to, to look at other countries immediately. And this brings me to my last question where uh, I would like to give you each one minute to sort of uh, think and answer, answer that, uh, that point. Um, if you could... It, it, it all sounds pretty rosy overall. Like it seems like a good time for for green green tech in general. Um, what's the main hurdle that you do face, and uh, how would you ideally want to have it solved? You're, you're oh, looking I'll at go me. With you, yes. 
Yeah. Um, so I wish for people taking technology uh, to use faster. Uh, and I don't know exactly how to do it. There should be some incentivized, some regulations that support it. Uh, but yeah, I wish people would be more technology minded. <laughs> a first mover incentive policy. Yes. All right. Yes, because we have to meet our sustainability goals in order to meet the uh, uh, climate warming of 1.5 uh, degrees, right? And we have to uh, work towards it today. We have to take decisions now. We have to take. Uh, uh, we have to make things happen, and technology is one of the things that can help and it's the fastest thing that can be implemented that provides really fast already results. Well, we just had the Minister of Climate on the stage, so just talk to him about your proposal and maybe we're going to make it a law very soon. Mm -hmm. uh, Tarvo. For us, it seems to be the variety of different legislations, even inside Europe, not talking oh, yeah. and, and, the, and the rest of the world as well. So, for example, coming from digitalized Estonia, when we go to other countries with our technology, we always have to downgrade. We, we have to start from very simple things, explaining what we can do, and then build on these uh, really fast reserves and complicated uh, services that our technology can do. So that's, that's, that's usually the main, main thing, that we cannot give them everything that we have, because they are just... Uh, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's uh, our strength as well. The more, with more countries we work, the stronger we are, the better we understand it. And um, mm, I wanted to say is that basically all of those countries are going where we are coming from. So we pretty much know uh, what the aim is. So this is what makes it uh, simple for us. Well, that does make it easier, yes. Robin. Yeah, for us, the biggest challenge is uh, lack of regulatory clarity. Well, it's, cr it's crazy, like entrepreneurs saying that you need more regulations, but uh, right now in the uh, carbon field, we need more clarity. Uh, there are two, let's say there are two companies, both are doing carbon credits. They might be doing extremely different things, uh, and both say that these are carbon credits, but today there's no standard or clarity yet on the definitions. Uh, same How is that possible? The, Sorry? How is that possible? I thought there was a market that we all agreed on. Well, it, it, it is the ETS, the emission trading system, but I mean for sequestration and in the agricultural field and so on. It's emerging, so that's a good thing. But obviously these things take time and these are the challenges and risks for investors and so on, but we are moving to the right direction. And for us, the kind of North Star is making sure that farmers store more carbon in the soil. If we will do this, then in the long run, everything will be fine. Some famous last words, Caddy. Well, it's, um, it's clear that the key word here is regulation and uh, public-private partnership here. Um, I know that regulation is supposed to move slowly to create stability uh, in our societies, but our strength in the clean tech sector is to be agile, to move fast and to propose new solutions. So we have to find new ways to work together between the public sector and the private sector in order to create the market for the emerging clean tech as soon as possible, to make sure that they're allowed on the market in the first place, because uh, it's true that oftentimes the regulation or, or the measurements or whatever is needed to come to market does not exist, so we need it fast. Um, we don't want to have uh, innovation in clean techs. We're staying in the laboratories because we're not allo allowed them on the market. Um, so, so yes, I, I think it would be good to good to conclude by saying that we need to increase collaboration between bigger companies who should be adopting and deploying clean tech, uh, the clean tech innovators themselves, of course. Uh, the investors and the public sector. I think if we manage to all uh, start understanding each other's um, barriers, uh, opportunities, strengths, uh, we can take this sector very far and, and solve our green transition issue as well. That was a lovely wish list, very easy to implement. We'll get right on it after this panel uh, discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear audience, please join me in thanking our panelists for this lovely discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.